This is the Scripture and Ministry interview series. My name is Hans Matawemi. I'm the Managing Director of the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. And next to me is Pastor Steve Farish, who is the pastor of um, Crossroads, Crossroads Church. Church in Grays Lake. <laughs> and we're with um, Pastor Alistair Begg, who's been with us since yesterday. And he gave um, a Scripture and Ministry lecture on um, inadequacy. And that was a very stimulating talk and a good Q&A. Um, I thought I'd maybe, uh, thanks for joining us um, Thank you. today. I thought I'd maybe open up just, uh, you've got that great Scottish accent and um, people, a lot of our listeners might be wondering what your background is and how you, how you ended up um, with your ministry here. And actually I should mention, he's, you can also hear him uh, pretty much daily on Truth For Life on the radio. So. Yes, yeah, it's a fair question, isn't it? I think some people think that, uh, that I came um, on my own initiative to evangelize America, but uh, <laughs> in actual fact, I came by the invitation of the church that uh, okay. I serve. Okay. And in 1981, a man arrived uh, without uh, any introduction, literally at the front door of our house in Scotland, hmm. and announced that he was from a church on the east side of Cleveland, and they were looking for a minister. And uh, that began uh, a saga which uh, uh, lasted uh, over a period of uh, about 19 months, whereby they invited me to come and visit Cleveland, Ohio, which I had to look for on a map. <laughs> I didn't know where Ohio was, to my shame, let alone Cleveland. Right. When I found it, I wasn't really excited about it. And when I got there, I thought there are a lot better places in America if you were ever going to go. Right. But uh, in the providence of God, um, I, I accepted what turned out to be their second invitation. I declined okay. their initial invitation, feeling that I uh, couldn't leave Scotland. And, and, uh, but it came in on the 3rd of August, 1983, okay. to, to this church, and we've been there now f for the last 28 years. Okay. And that's Parkside? Church. Parkside, yeah. yes. It was, it was called the chapel when I got there, okay. and um, we relocated we spent six and a half years in a high school, and uh, when we finally uh, dropped down into another uh, area of the geography, uh, we were right next to a park, and I wanted to have the name church in our name. Okay. I didn't like chapel right. uh, for a variety of reasons, but, um, and so I, we, we simply called ourselves Parkside, Parkside Church. Right. So we've been, we've been that for the, since uh, 1993. Okay. And where were you past? Were you pastoring yep, yep. Pr in Scotland or prior? Yeah, I, uh, I began as the assistant to Derek Prime in okay. Charlotte Chapel okay. in, the, in the center of Edinburgh. I was there for two years. I was ordained there. Okay. And then I was called to a church on the west side of Scotland, a place called Hamilton, which is about 14 or 15 miles outside of Glasgow, which is where I was born. Okay. And I was there then for six years on my own before I hmm. came to came to Cleveland. Was that a Baptist church? It was a Baptist church. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes. I have a follow-up question mm -hmm. from your lecture yesterday, which, by the way, uh, I thought the, the Lord gave great grace, and I encourage everybody who watches this interview also to watch the and listen to the lecture from yesterday. Immensely helpful. As you talked about inadequacy, mainly as Paul frames it in 2 Corinthians. Right. But I wondered about this question. Are inadequacy uh, and humility close? Are they the same thing? And then second, what are the means of grace that God gives us through which the Holy Spirit promotes, if that's the right word, develops a sense of a godly and appropriate sense of inadequacy humility in our lives. I know in um, C.J. Mahaney's book on humility, he jokes that one of the means that God surely uses is golf, because right. it's a yeah. very humbling yeah. game. But uh, yeah. what, are, what would be some of the means of grace in, in your mind? Well, first of all, inadequacy and humility, are they synonymous? Um, I'm not sure that they are, because um, we could be aware of our inadequacy and try and cover it up rather than acknowledge it, rather than it allows us to see the end of ourselves okay. and the need for God. So I suppose it'd be possible, I think, 
we probably can think of instances where instead of saying, you know, oh, what a wretched man I am who will deliver me from this body of death, we try and bolster our egos and, and struggle on for a while. So I, I think that needs to be thought out. I haven't really thought it out. But uh, um, means of grace, uh, well, his word, uh, the word of God, which is, you know, sharper than a two-edged sword and cuts right down to the, to the quick of things. If we really are, if our hearts are, are truly open to the scriptures, both in our study of them and then in the delivery of them. In other words, if we, if we as pastors, think of pastors for a moment, are preaching the gospel to ourselves, then we are then being transformed by the very word that we're given to proclaim. However, if we're not, if we become some kind of siphon whereby we're just delivering material as a sort of second-hand agent, then uh, that, that failure will eventually become inevitable for us. Um, along, along with the Word of God and the normal, uh, the, the, the normal means of grace, the, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the gathering of God's people, the place of prayer, um, I think suffering is, is actually one of the things that God uses. And you have that illustrated in 2 Corinthians 12, that right. out of the, you know, the, the supernatural encounter of Paul that is described in the opening verses, he then immediately says, and to keep me from becoming conceited or to keep me from uh, having an, a, a preening view of my own esteem, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. So he actually sees it as the intervention of God in his life to the end that he will be saved from becoming boastful and proud, particularly about not just giftedness, but about the spiritual encounter, which clearly was second to none. And so, uh, you know, how does God do that? Well, sometimes I think physically. Um, uh, sometimes I was speaking last night to parents uh, of uh, middle school children, and, and I said, you know, I think that God gives us children to sanctify us. You know, that mm -hmm. there are no tears shed by a parent, more significant tears than the tears that we shed over our children. And God may choose to bring into our lives. In fact, if you think about church history, if you think about the history of the church and the people that God has used, not a few of them have faced significant challenges, either within their own marriage or within their own family life. And somehow or another, Romans 8, 28 has been at work in that, that in all these things, God is at work for their good to conform them to the image of his son, which he can't do or doesn't do apart from, you know, engendering humility in our lives. But now I'm going on, so I'll stop. I was wondering, um, just uh, since you've been in the North America for a few years, um, what, are, what are some of the similarities and differences between the evangelical church here and perhaps in Scotland? And what, what, what are some lessons that perhaps you could share uh, with some of our listeners? Well, you know, I'm so enculturated here now that I've sort of I've, <laughs> yeah. I've lost my prophetic edge or, or maybe, maybe I've been co-opted. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm such an American now, I don't even know. Um, uh, well, first of all, you know, the ties between Britain and the United States are, are significant ties mm -hmm. between the Scottish people and the American people. And, right. uh, and we are the beneficiaries of the largesse of American giving, American generosity, mm -hmm. and many of the things that have been, uh, that have thrived in the United Kingdom have thrived as a result of uh, the encouragement and oftentimes the financial support of America. Mm -hmm. um, but, but growing up uh, in Scotland, the, um, you know, I, I, I remember I was three years old in 1955, which I think was when Billy Graham was mm. uh, doing one of his big crusades uh, in the United Kingdom in a football ground in Glasgow. And, you know, so the, the era through which I've lived has been an era in which there has been that very close uh, cross-fertilization between the evangelical community. So you think, for example, of the passing of John Stott yeah. and the and the influence that Stott has had on American life mm -hmm. um, and on American evangelicalism, mm -hmm. helping in some measure to save elements of it from 
um, a form of fundamentalism mm -hmm. that runs the risk of taking what is arguably secondary or peripheral and making it central. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that I would try and argue the case that British evangelicalism managed in large measure to steer clear of some of the excesses of a, of a legalistic fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Not exclusively, but, but in large measure. So some of the things that would be regarded as being in the very uh, center or, or, or the, the, the core of orthodoxy mm -hmm. in the American context would not necessarily have been so. Right. So, for example, someone like Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he writes his little booklet in the 30s or 40s, What is an Evangelical? You know, he, he puts at the back of that book seven things that he will not break fellowship with other believers over. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those seven things, you know, in the American context, they largely are right. the seven things that we will all break right. fellowship with each other over. Right. Um, that's as good as I can yeah. do with that for the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were one of the early participants in the Gospel Coalition. Uh, could you say a word about your work with that organization and maybe comment more broadly on the rise of that organization in American evangelicalism and the significance of that? Well, actually, I'm not really qualified to, to, to do that. I, I was fairly early on part of what was the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Right when Jim Boyce was still alive and when that group uh, included uh, David Wells and Michael Horton and R.C. Sproul and, mm -hmm. and those folks. And so I had the privilege of being there in some of the early days of that. That has sort of ameliorated into, it's still in existence, I'm still on, <laughs> on its council or something. But, uh, but the Gospel Coalition, I have a very small part in. I had the privilege of, of addressing at this past event. But it's a cause of great um, um, happiness, I think, for all the initiative that has been taken by Don Carson and others to seek to galvanize uh, shared convictions around the gospel itself. And in large measure has, has uh, helped to accomplish some of the things that we're referencing vis-a-vis -vis Stott and so on. Um, the, the, the only caveat that I would give to that, and I've been thinking quite a lot about it since I was there, and I'm, I'm wary of doing it in this context, but I'm, <laughs> I'm committed now, so I'll keep going. Um, Press on. The, yeah, the, I, I, I'm just eagerly awaiting the arrival of a new book on Charles Simeon that has been written by Derek mm. Prime, the man that I was huh. assistant to. I, I pre-read the book, and the 15th chapter is entitled Simeon on Balance. Hmm. And it, it uh, chronicles Simeon's um, thoughts on the dialogue between uh, an Arminian and a Calvinistic oh, yeah. perspective on yeah. soteriology. Yeah. And I think the only thing that I would say is that this gospel coalition, um, at least ostensibly, seems not to, not to appeal in the same degree to those who may not have a sort of reform view of things. Mm -hmm. And so in that respect, it still has a ways to go to really be a coalition that is representative mm -hmm. of evangelicalism across the board. Mm -hmm. During your, I'm not sure if it was during your talk yesterday or during the question and answer, but the question of celebrity came up. I mean especially in relation to your topic of, to the topic of inadequacy. And, um, you know, in some ways, evangelicalism is, at least in some circles, is doing pretty well and, um, um, and has got large audiences, different conferences, and, and so on. I mean, we've talked about Gospel Coalition, but there are other groups. Um, and this question of celebrity has come up in different venues. And... And um, I, I just wonder if you have any thoughts about, about that. Just the, uh, you know, maybe the dangers of celebrity or, or, or you know, like evangelicals in the past have been sort of marginalized and on the margins and the shape of the faith looks a certain way. But then when you're suddenly in the spotlight, there's new challenges. And right. I don't know if we're all, we're all that 
prepared to know even how to grapple with, with those realities. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about, uh, about any of that. Uh, well, you know, I think, I think evangelicalism within the country is, is still really marginalized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you take, for example, the celebrations for um, uh, the remembrances for 2000 uh, and uh, for 9-11, and um, right. yeah. the, the hue and cry that emerged from the evangelical camp about being unrepresented yes. in the National Cathedral. Yes. My reaction to that was, why are we even asking the question? Mm -hmm. You know, did you think that the Apostle Paul would be represented, you know, mm -hmm. at the forum in Rome, mm -hmm. uh, that he would be invited to give an address? Mm -hmm. that, that Christianity was entirely countercultural. Mm -hmm. That it was, and, and the real questions of, you know, when you know, Constantine is converted, did we advance or did we regress mm -hmm. in terms of the development of the church? Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of, ha I, I'm happy with the, with the off-scouring status right. of, of Christianity. Right. I think there's more of a chance for us from that perspective than in being potentially seduced and absorbed mm -hmm. by our desire to be mainstream. Mm -hmm. When you come within the framework of evangelicalism itself, mm -hmm. then a lot of us have a lot to answer for in respect to the fact that probably the biggest danger to the church is its man-centeredness mm -hmm. and that it's impossible for us even to address it without having to face ourselves and any contribution that we make to the predicament. Mm -hmm. But it is a peculiar snare. Mm -hmm. there, is a re there, are, there are fundamental dangers in it. Mm -hmm. because all of us are happy to be affirmed and uh, to be, you know, told how significant we are. And, mm -hmm. and um, no one is happier to champion that cause than the evil one himself. Mm -hmm. So that the, the, the call to, from Paul to Timothy in a context of antagonism and, and uh, false teachers and so on, in 2 Timothy 4, the very first thing he says to him is, but you, Timothy, keep your head. In the King James Version, be sober-minded. Mm -hmm. And then he says, endure hardship. Mm -hmm. So um, the, 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 I think that uh, two millennia on, we do well to pay attention to that exhortation mm -hmm. to keep our heads. Mm -hmm. Because it would seem that the evil one is, very, is happy to neutralize us, either by squeezing our heads down to nothing, by telling us we, we are so... Uh, so pathetically useless, or alternatively, depending on, on how we respond to his insinuations, to inflate our egos. Mm -hmm. But either, either way, he neutralizes us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the publishing companies have a part to play in this. Right. You know, do we really need to walk underneath banners? Right. <laughs> uh, do we, do, and, and what does it feel like? Do you know what it feels like? We know what it feels like to go to the conferences. I remember the first time that I went to a conference in Seattle or somewhere with R.C. Sproul and Michael Horton and some others, probably David Wells, and uh, they announced to my great chagrin that when the evening session finished, we would be uh, going through to the, uh, the, the hall, mm -hmm. and in the hall, all the tables would be set up with the individual speakers, and their books would be on the table for signing. For signing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have any books. Right. So all I had was a table with a sign. <laughs> and so, so what are you going to do? Yeah. So I, I started, I said, excuse me, uh, in the absence of any of my own books, uh, I will sign any books. <laughs> and, and I will sign them with anyone's name. I right. will sign them Spurgeon, Charles Wesley, <laughs> yeah. Jonathan Edwards, anything you like. Well, it became a great figure of fun. Yeah. And people were bringing all kinds of books to me to sign them. So I had fun with it. Yeah. But... Along with that goes the sort of standard evangelical hype, which is, you know, the big picture for the, you know, the big guy, the middle picture, the, the tiny picture, mm -hmm. the magnifying glass <laughs> yes. picture, yes. the no picture. Yes. We've got it upside down. Hmm. So, uh, and maybe getting a bit personal, I mean, for someone like you, I mean, you've truthful life, you know, you, you can, we can see you online, we can hear you on the radio, um, and, you know, you're the pastor of a very significant church in Cleveland. What, 
I mean, what are some personal ways that you have kind of, obviously you'd have to wrestle with some of these. How have you tried yeah. to deal with, yeah. with those challenges over the years? Well, I've tried not to cultivate the notion, it, you know, in my own, in my own mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's th that Reagan quote from yesterday, you see, you can take the office seriously without taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. um, a, a good group of men around you over a long period of time mm -hmm. who, who know the good, the bad, and the ugly about you mm -hmm. is a tremendous asset. People who will speak into your lives. Mm -hmm. So encounters like I'm in an elders meeting probably 15 years ago, maybe longer, and I have an interchange with one of my fellow elders in which I believe him to be in the wrong and myself to be in the right. And I let him know just how badly in the wrong he is in, in front of all the other elders. Mm -hmm. Following morning, I get a telephone call from one of the other elders <clears throat> who had been a, a Navy pilot in Vietnam and a Texan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and as he said, uh, last night what you said was true but how you said it was wrong, and the context in which you said it was unhelpful. Hmm. What I want you to do, he said to me, is phone the man concerned and apologize to him, and then phone me back and tell me when you've done it. Hmm. Now, that was, a, that was a pivotal moment in, in that whole plurality of leadership for me. Mm -hmm. Was I now going to say, put the phone down and say, who does he think he is? Mm -hmm. Doesn't he realize? Mm -hmm. Or was I going to take it as a, as a wound from a friend? Mm -hmm. And was I going to do what was necessary to do? Mm -hmm. In the goodness of God, I was enabled to do what I ought to do. And because of that, I'm able to mention it. The danger is that I mention it with a feeling of pride in it <laughs> and then lose the blessing. Yeah, but right, right. but uh, men like that are vital. Mm -hmm. A wife who loves you but is not enamored by you. Right. And children who respect you dearly and are thankful for you but don't puff your ego. Mm -hmm. If, for example, my son, who is 32, said to me some time ago, Dad, why don't you write a book that someone wants to read? <laughs> so I said, well, <laughs> now, I said, I said, now there's, a, there's an encouraging <laughs> idea right there. But he, he loves me with a passion, and he's right. a funny kid, you know. Right. But the point was well made. Hmm. Um, those things and more. But I, and I think, my, I think the people who are my mentors help me in this. Derek Prime, mm -hmm. Eric Alexander, uh, Dick Lucas, mm -hmm. Alec Mattia. I have their photographs around me. And when I, f when I feel my head expanding, I, I look across and I see those men whose sandals I am unworthy mm -hmm. to untie. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, apart from Jesus being disappointed in me, I would hate for them to be, mm -hmm. and so, and so for me, the, 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 the issue for me is always to be on the receiving end of the initiative, not to be in the initiator. Mm -hmm. my, my, uh, my personality is, I suppose, entrepreneurial. I'm, I'm thinking of things to do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying over time to think about things that are about the church and about Parkside and about that kind of thing and not about the, the exaltation of my own profile mm -hmm. in that. Right. So, for example, the radio program was not started by me, but actually was generated by a boy who was a teenager in Parkside when I got there, who was at broadcasting school and then was working mm -hmm. at Moody. And he took the initiative and annoyed everybody at Moody to, to, to say, you know, could you, don't, don't you think that our pastor could get a shot on the radio? Mm -hmm. And when they came to us with the proposal, uh, we said, we said, no, we, we, we think that we should stay away from this for all kinds of reasons. So we were in the end reluctant participants right. in it. Right. And then once we're in it, the, you know, the responsibility is when you go to these events where lots of people come to see the funny face with the funny voice, <laughs> that, you, that you are, you know, just gut-wrenchingly honest about, about all these things. Mm -hmm. It's a snare. Yeah. It's a snare. But, but part of the battle is being, uh, being alert to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And over time, I've had people come to me and say, how do you start this? And how do you do that? And how do you get a radio program? Right. 
And I always say, well, you start by not wanting to get one. Mm -hmm. And then, they, then mm -hmm. they don't know what to do from there mm -hmm. because that's a completely different profile. Right. That's helpful. Thanks. Is that right? Yeah. Sort of like Jesus' parable about being asked, taking yeah, a seat are you going to at, sit? The, at the foot of the table. It's hard though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's it's hard because you yeah, go to the hard. wedding receptions and you look at those numbers mm -hmm. you, and you, you know how, how egotistical you are <laughs> whether you start at you know, table 27 or table 4. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, so and, sure, and the right? pastor thinks he's, you know... I, well, we should be somewhere at least right. in the top five. Right. You know, right. you say, we know, Pastor, that it's good for you to be in table <laughs> table forty nine. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask a question about longevity because you've been pastor at Parkside now for for twenty eight years. It it occurs to me when um, we often see people when they each reach the age of a hundred years, interviewed on television, and the interviewer asks, "What's the secret of?" living to be a hundred years. <laughs> so what's the, what's the secret to surviving as pastor of a church for 28 years? Well, you know, I joked earlier about Cleveland, but, you know, from a, from a human perspective, there's no earthly reason to go to Cleveland when you can go to San Francisco or to New York or to, you know, a place, or to Austin, Texas. Um, but there's no ideal place to serve God except the place he sets you down. And so the first thing I think is that deep-seated conviction about the rightness of being where you're supposed to be. Uh, sometimes that is not fixed in the heart or mind of an individual. And so the temptation then is to be constantly looking for the next best option. So, okay, well, we got our foot in the door. We're in Cleveland. We could get out of Ohio. Maybe we could get into Illinois. After all, Chicago, you know, or wherever we could go. And over 28 years, there have been uh, occasions when the appeal to me to leave Cleveland has been a very strong pull. I have to say, sadly, that a lot of it very sort of earthly in its, in its uh, invitation. You know, wouldn't you, I know you like to play golf. Wouldn't you like to be able to play golf all year round? Uh, I, we know you like this. Wouldn't you like that? We could do this. How about that? Mm -hmm. How big is your thing? You know, do you, do you, would you like a larger thing? Mm -hmm. You know, do we have a, you, that kind of thing. I put the phone, I say, who are these people? Who are these people? Do they even understand ministry? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the first thing is being in the place of God's appointing. And along with that, a deepening sense of the rightness of that. So that God didn't just call me to America. He called me to Cleveland, Ohio. To the best of my understanding, he has never released me from that call. In the providence of God, he has chosen to give me and a ministry that takes me beyond the bounds of Cleveland, Ohio, without ever having to leave it. But a ministry that only exists because I am committed to Cleveland, Ohio, because the thing that keeps me honest and grounded is the fact that Sunday's coming. You know, here we are, and it's Thursday, but Sunday's coming. I have to go home this afternoon. I have to preach four times on Sunday. And that is my primary calling. That is my duty. That's my responsibility. And I rejoice in that. I love that. My happiest times are my Sunday evening communion services. When I finally sit at the end of the day, usually on the steps, I look out on the congregation, I say to myself, this is why I exist. This is, this is why I exist. I don't get that feeling by privileges like this. I enjoy this, but it doesn't float my boat. It doesn't get me up in the morning. You could take all of this away and I would miss it, but it wouldn't rob my identity of anything. You take my ministry in the routine pastoral responsibilities of week-by-week -week ministry, and I have no raison d'etre. I, I, mm. Who am I? I? I'm only this. And so that then, and the toleration and the patience of the people, that they're prepared to put up with you, that you reach points where they realize that you're not all that they hope for you to be, but they still love you and they'll tolerate you. And you realize that they are not the congregation that you thought they were or that they're going to be. 
and you realize they're the people that God has given you and that you're not constantly looking over your shoulder for, um, you know, or out over the horizon looking for the next best opportunity. Mm. That, I think, is for me. But having said all of that, I don't know whether I should be commended for sticking at it or criticized for a horrible lack of initiative. You know? <laughs> so, so I, said, I can't believe you've been there 28 years. I mean, don't you have any ideas? I mean, <laughs> have you never been anywhere? Um, so, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I don't, I'm not a prophet, but uh, I think this is my life's ministry in Cleveland. I, I, I think I will see things out pastorally there unless something that I don't anticipate comes across the horizon. Hmm. The, you, you mentioned um, just the importance of rootedness and being connected with the local church. Um, uh, there, there's uh, been some conversation amongst some evangelical pastors about uh, multi-site churches, <laughs> which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, just curious what your thoughts are on that, the, the good, the bad, the you know, how to strike a balance in that, in that conversation. Yeah. Well, first of all, I should tell you where we are as far as Parkside is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, at the present time, we have a, we have a second campus, mm -hmm. which in my, uh, to fit my uh, MO, came to us. We didn't create it. Right. This is, a, this is a church that was dying about 40 miles away from us in the Akron-Kenton area okay. that came to us and said, will you adopt us? Uh, will you take us over because we're on our last legs? Mm -hmm. And so we have actually um, adopted a, a, a church family. They're, 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 they, they are no more. They are now us. Right. So Parkside is, exists uh, here and it exists there. Okay. Because of the nature of um, the church, because there were only two young fellows, good fellows, but th that was all that was left, mm -hmm. we decided pro tem that the best thing we could do to build credibility for that site was actually to, act, to identify it directly as Parkside Church. Okay. So if you drive down there, the sign that is there is the same sign that is present in our, in our other campus. Mm -hmm. And the Sunday morning preaching is taken from our 8.30 service by video to that campus, mm -hmm. and I am on the screen there in the morning. Okay. In the evening, the young men are responsible for the teaching in the evening service. Okay. That hybrid allows me to accomplish both things at the moment, to try and give them the support that is represented in the credibility that is right. ours, right. church-wise. Right. But also it remains, it, it allows me to remain committed to what I'm really committed to, and that is the development of young men for pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. This is a short-term strategy on our part. Mm -hmm as soon as the leadership, lay leadership is established in that congregation, then they will call a pastor. They may choose to call one from our pastoral team, I don't know. Right. But they will call a pastor, the screen will be dismantled, beg will go away, and the church will be established. Right. The, 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 the newest church planting thing that we're doing is embryonic at the moment, but it's with one of our own young men, a Trinity grad, who is now uh, in Lake County, working with a small group of people to plant a church there. Mm -hmm. But we're not using the same, the right. same model. Right. And uh, we may use that same model again if there was a reason to do so. Mm -hmm. But philosophically, I am leery of the multi-site thing. Mm -hmm. I understand the pragmatic benefits of it. It frees up more pulpits. Therefore, the idea that we really are giving more people a chance to preach mm -hmm. um, is accomplished. That seems to me to be a reaction to churches where the fellows who are on the pastoral team never really get a chance to preach anyway, which isn't true of Parkside. Mm -hmm. All of my guys preach. Mm -hmm. And in the Sundays that I'm gone, they preach. Mm -hmm. So they, they're, they're having that opportunity. My pulpit is not exclusive to me. It's shared. So we don't need to, to find another mechanism to make sure that they have an opportunity to preach. Mm -hmm. What scares me most, again, is the issue of celebrity. Mm -hmm is the idea that um, my, my, what God has chosen to do in and through me is of such significance that it should take precedence mm -hmm. over the others who are on my pastoral team having the joy and privilege of doing what I do with a group of people mm -hmm. in, a, in a community. Mm 
-hmm. And I don't have any reason to, um, you know, uh, criticize or, or, or say anything untoward about my brothers who are, who are doing something apparently very effectively mm -hmm. uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. But for myself, um, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine a situation where we have, you know, 10 or 12 fellows on the pastoral team and then I tell them all, I say, by the way, you know, whatever you're going to do, don't ever think about learning how to preach or teach or pastor mm -hmm. because there's just going to be 10 of us in the end in America that are going to control the entire place. Mm -hmm. And everybody's just going to be watching on their iPhone in any case. Mm -hmm. And the whole church thing will have been dismantled and people will be meeting together in the back of Starbucks and the notions of community and so on will have been devolved. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that devolution, again, is a significant aspect that I'm not sure has been completely thought out. Mm -hmm. It's too soon to determine whether this model is actually a good model for the church, I mm. think. In the short term, hey, I understand. Right. Hmm. <laughs> Did I play both sides? I no, don't know. <laughs> no, that was, that, I'm, glad you, yeah, I'm glad you shared that about your Parkside Zone right. experience. Um, yeah. with that. You spoke in that last answer and you also talked a little bit yesterday in fact you mentioned about working yourself out of a job right. ultimately about um, this passion you have for being used by the Lord to raise up the next generation of pastors could you speak to how Parkside does that practically you did a little bit yesterday well we really programmatically I've got nothing to say you know we have no we're, we're very I am very poor on the sort of strategic plan stuff, you know. I mean, I could, I could probably, you know, I'd say this. There, there's my strategic <laughs> plans. For, it's, um, and um, so we're really, the, the sort of, the, the conviction that underpins it is understood. So that there is an ethos, if you like, whereby young people, young men in particular, are beginning to gravitate towards Parkside because the word is out that they'll help you there figure out some of the basics of pastoral ministry and they may be able to, you know, launch you on your way and encourage you. Mm -hmm. At the moment, that's enough uh, for us to go on. Uh, over 28 years, I've, I've had the opportunity of having all kinds of fellows on the pastoral team who today are in different places. Um, as I drove in the car last night with a young man who's a, who's a student here, really what the encounter in the car was about was it, it, I, I felt like I was now back in time. I was the driver and I was sitting next to one of the men that means so much to me. I, I don't mean that in a sense of self-aggrandizement right. that I'm very significant, but, but the roles were reversed. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly what that was like. I, want, I know I've got 30 minutes in the car. I need to ask every question that I've ever <laughs> yeah. thought of, you know? Yeah. And that was what was happening last night. I may never have an ongoing encounter with that young man, but I hope in the providence of God that I, that I encouraged him in relationship to the questions that he has in relationship to pastoral ministry. And that's what I'm seeking to do with the, the men on my pastoral team. And um, that comes out in different ways. Uh, with, with depending on who the individuals are. But um, I, I'm not very good on the formalized aspects of it. I do have people around me who, who think that out. Mm -hmm. I'm more, I'm pretty uh, subjective and um, um, emotional in, in those things, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. People are going to catch it from me rather than, you know, I give it to them in six, six points. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, uh, do we have time for one more question? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, the Henry Center, one of the, our main sort of interests is helping to bridge the gap between the church and the academy. And just feeling that um, there's a lot of good things happening in the academic setting um, um, with theologians and professors working at, uh, at thinking Christianly about all kinds of things. And then in the church, there's obviously God is doing great things through the church, um, but sometimes there's a disconnect between those two worlds. And so, you know, the scripture ministry series, for instance, is one of the ways we're trying to help bridge that gap. Do you have any thoughts on that 
that, that tension between the church and the academy and, and ways that, in which um, we can help, help bridge that gap in your experience, from your experience? Well, you know, it's, you know, it's well said that it's Carl Henry who you know, embodied sanctified scholarship mm -hmm. for us, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And was such a tremendous help both in his speaking and his writing. And he, he is now represented by a, by a large company of individuals who, are, mm -hmm. who have, if you like, taken up the cause and are following his example. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure that I, I have much to say about the tension between them as to say how important, you know, to, to follow on from what you're saying, how important it is that the, the academy, if you like, uh, keeps, keeps in mind that the, the, the best of their stuff needs, needs somehow or another to be able to be understood by those of us who are in the trenches. Right. You know, I'm not sure that we really need any more technical commentaries. I, I may be wrong, I've but, I, but I'm, not, I'm not sure if we need any more. Hmm. I mean, does anybody need to do John now after Carson? I don't know. Um, maybe, but I, I, I don't need it. I, I, and so, the, but the materials that are be doing where, where the people in the academy are able to take on the battle in the front lines, mm -hmm. uh, for example, at the present time, the questions over the Genesis narratives, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much of this can, can we actually ground in, you know, historical verities. Mm -hmm. um, as a pastor, you know, going through Genesis, I neither have the capacity nor the time to do the kind of research that is necessary. Right. And therefore, uh, the folks who are here at Trinity or whoever else it is mm -hmm. can be a phenomenal asset to me mm -hmm. by the papers they write, by the books they produce. Mm -hmm. But thinking not so much of adding to the, to the genre of you know, academic literature mm -hmm. as saying the reason we're writing this is because the fellows that are on the front line with this need it need it fed to them at a level that can then be communicated to their people. Right. Right. And, uh, and so one of the other ways, of course, is when an institution such as Trinity does what it does, and that is opens its doors to the surrounding church's laity mm -hmm. by giving them the opportunity to, to be instructed in theology or in biblical hermeneutics mm -hmm. by the faculty here in a way that once again shows to the to the to the folks that attend the synergy that exists mm -hmm. between uh, mm -hmm. between the pulpit and the uh, and the professor's chair. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, not not to let just narrowly academic concerns completely characterize what happens in, say, an evangelical academic setting, but that the church and the concerns of the church are are in some ways just informing and motivating, motivating the, the kind of scholarship that happens. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, that's, that's a lesson that has to be learned uh, by the students who come because mm -hmm. we come out as students and we've been having to write all these papers and, and reading these hard books. Mm -hmm. And then if we're not careful, we're gonna start giving that to our, to yeah. our congregation. Right. Right. And it usually <laughs> takes a little so while to, <laughs> To suddenly realize, yep. oh, they're not. This is not. This is not where they are. Right. So that you've got the distillation or the filtration process right. that comes within the context of day-to-day -day pastoral ministry, mm -hmm. because ultimately people are our books, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know the doctrine of providence has to has to settle in some way when you're sitting at the bedside of a young mother. Who has just lost twins five and a half months into her pregnancy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. she, she's not remotely interested in the, the seven views on the doctrine of providence. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But those seven views, or the view, or whatever, mm -hmm. has, is vital. Right, right. So, right. right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pastor Beg, for being here. My with privilege. Us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you very for much. Listening.